U.S. culture. And we have three great presenters, and Dr. Chom, who I'm going to introduce in a minute, is going to tell you a little bit more about who they are. Uh, but that's basically what we're going to do today. Um, the series, the session will be two hours, or, well, it won't be two hours now. It'll be over at 430 so we will basically have three present presentations and then after all the presentations we'll have q a when you are speaking for the q a please make sure you push the white button when you speak and when you're done push the white button to turn it off okay i think that might be it um oh a quick reminder there are three more sessions after this session the next session is, is also going to be one of those I don't want to miss sessions. It's on China and Africa, and you don't want to miss it. And um, it's uh, October the 27th, China and Africa by Dr. Young Park, I believe. Is that correct? Right here. Um, and the one after that is fighting, Financing AIDS in Africa. And that's on November the 11th. And the last one, official one, is a colloquium in honor of Dr. Suleiman Yang. And our speaker is going to be Ali Mazari. And you don't want to miss that. And that is on November the 16th. Okay, so three more great sessions. But we are now in for, <clears throat> excuse me, a wonderful session. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. M. Bai Cham, who is my supervisor and the chairman of the Department of African Studies here. And he's going to give you a little bit more information about our speakers and also moderate the session. Dr. Cham. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, uh, thank you, Wheeler. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Wheeler. He's doing a real fantastic job managing this uh, Palava series. And uh, we're really very thankful for the great job you're doing, Willa. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, this uh, is um, a panel that is uh, being sponsored by the West African Research Association, which is uh, headquartered currently in uh, Boston, Massachusetts at uh, Boston University. Uh, WARA, as uh, the acronym is uh, for West African Research Association, was formed in 1989, and its first headquarters was here at Howard University. Two of our faculty members, one is retired and the other one is currently on board here, Jean Tungara, where uh, the people who were running it from uh, Howard University here. So um, in 2009, it came back to Howard, so to speak, uh, in the sense that I became president of the association. So we're very, very happy to be, um, it's not working? Okay. We're very happy to be uh, co-sponsoring, um, or to be sponsoring this particular session here in uh, association with uh, the History and Political Science Department of Montgomery College. We had a fantastic session there this morning and the African Studies Department in the College of Arts and Sciences here at uh, Howard University. Um, you all have some material in front of you that gives you some information about the West African Research uh, Association. It is uh, um, a very dynamic organization that is really doing great work um, enabling research, facilitating research for scholars, um, American scholars who are interested in West Africa, as well as uh, facilitating work for West African scholars who are also doing research in West Africa and other parts of Africa. So the mission of the organization is really geared towards uh, facilitating these kinds of collaboration and, 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 uh, and partnerships between West African and uh, American scholars. And, uh, the association is also, more importantly, uh, part of a network, a broader network of American overseas research centers. And the council of that center is here in Washington, D.C. Now, WADA operates um, the West African Research Center, which is in um, uh, Dakar, Senegal. And it's the only center uh, that is part of the 
American overseas research centers that is cited in sub-Saharan Africa. So we are very, very proud of the work that we've been doing and uh, would like to encourage you as much as possible to look very closely into the organization and consider coming on board as an individual member or to encourage your various institutions to come on board as institutional memberships. There are many, many advantages to um, becoming a member of WARA and plugging into that network of the American Overseas Research Centers. And uh, today we are very, very glad and honored to have actually um, a representative from uh, the uh, American Overseas, the council that runs the AORC here. Uh, that's Monica Clark. Uh, Monica, if you can just stand up. And Monica actually is uh, the one who also funded this particular series here through a grant from the Carnegie Foundation. So we, we, we're very glad to have her here with us. Thank you. <clears throat> um, uh, we we think that this particular session here is coming at a time when, uh, at a very opportune time, because there's a lot of heat, really, about Islam, about Muslims, about religion, and uh, what we need is really more light. And what we have assembled here this afternoon is uh, a group of scholars who are going to share with us their tremendous experience, their wealth of experience, the kind of work, very innovative, very cutting edge work that they have been doing on various aspects of the Islamic experience, the Muslim experience, not just in Africa, but also uh, in the United States here. So we are very, very glad to uh, be able to host this particular session here. And uh, we hope that we'll have enough time after their presentations to engage them uh, in, 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 in very, very productive ways. Um, I'm going to start introducing them uh, in the order that they will be speaking. First of all, on my extreme left, we have Dr. Erin August, who is Associate Professor of, of Sociology and Africana Studies at Ramapo College of New Jersey, where she teaches courses on race relations, gender, and religion. Her research focuses on young women who joined conservative Islamic reform movements in West Africa. She also studies the life experiences and gender roles of North African migrants to Senegal and West African migrants to New York City. She's co uh, currently completing a book on reformist Muslim women in Dakar, Senegal. Erin uh, will be followed by Dr. Husseina Alidu, who is uh, originally from Niger and uh, is currently director of the African Studies Center at uh, Rutgers University in New Brunswick. Uh, Dr. Alidu holds a PhD in theoretical linguistics with a minor in African studies and literacy from Indiana University in Bloomington. Uh, she has transdisciplinary research orientation with a focus on linguistics, cultural politics, and gender studies. She's the author of Engaging Modernity, Muslim Women and Politics of Agency, which was published in 2005, and the co-editor of A Thousand Flowers, The Struggle for Education in African Universities. And uh, Usaina will be followed finally by Dr. Falun Gom, who hails from Senegal. And uh, Falu is an Associate Professor of Anthropology and Director of the African Language Program at Boston University. His current research interests include the interactions between African languages and non-African languages, the Africanization of Islam, the Ajami literature's records of West African languages written in the Arabic script. He also hopes to help train the first generation of American scholars to have direct access to the wealth of knowledge stored in West African Ajami literatures. His work has appeared in the International Journal of the Sociology of Language, the Journal of Multilingual and Multicultural Development, Language Variation and Change, and African Studies Review, among many others. Dr. Ngom uh, received a very, very prestigious fellowship this year, and we were very, very proud for his achievement as a young man, uh, the Guggenheim Fellow for 2011 and 2012. So, <laughs> congratulations, uh, Falu. 
So it's really um, a very, very um, great honor and pleasure for us to have uh, this distinguished group be with us here at Howard University this afternoon to share with us their experiences. So I'll turn over the proceeding, uh, the mic to um, Dr. Ergis. I would first uh, like to thank uh, Dr. Mbai Cham and Dr. Wheeler Winston, as well as the other organizers of this panel, uh, as well as you all for coming. It's such a pleasure to be here today. It's my first time visiting Howard University. Uh, I'll talk about my current research on conservative Muslim women and marriage in Dakar, Senegal, and then I will close with some observations on a few challenges marriage and immigration uh, in the West posed to Senegalese Muslim women, in addition to the ways they confront these challenges here in the United States. Uh, I will raise some questions that inform my own research interests in transnational families, and which might also be of interest to those of you uh, here who are conducting or planning research in the many important African immigrant communities in DC. The paper I will present to you today is primarily an endeavor to diversify understandings of Sunni reformist Muslim women's gendered forms of agency. Sunni reformists are conservative Muslims who contend that Islamic practice should not deviate from what is recommended in the Quran and Hadiths or authenticated traditions of the Prophet Muhammad and his companions. Sunni reformers oppose the pra or ostensibly oppose the practices of Muslims who adhere to Sufi traditions, which include religious music, chanting, worship at the tombs of saints, and membership in religious brotherhoods. Sunni reformers also advocate Arabic literacy and uphold, in Senegal at least, uphold Arabized customs that they perceive as representative of original, pure Islamic religiosity, uh, which for women do include veiling and reserve around men. Uh, nonetheless, Senegalese Sunni women's agency can be political, spiritual, social, and occasionally transgressive of established conservative Islamic uh, norms for women's emotions. In 12 years of narrative interviews I have conducted with female members of eight reformist organizations in Dakar, I have listened to women articulate multiple means of self-determination. Besides continually adding to my study new respondents who represent the increasing diversity of Dakar's conservative Sunni or Sunnit organizations, I have maintained regular contact with 12 women who participated in my original study from 1998 to 2000 when they were single and students in their late teens and early 20s. Upon each of my return trips to Senegal, I have interviewed them again, recording changes in their perceptions of their lives and of their activism. These 12 women, all highly educated in French or Franco-Arab schools, are of upper middle socioeconomic status in Dakar. They are not representative of all the women in my larger study, which draws from the Sunnites' highly diverse class and educational composition. Uh, it is, however, no accident that I remained closest to these 12 women their access to email and cell phones in the early years following my first study made it easy for us to stay in touch. They are now old friends as well as my respondents. They trust my promise to completely disguise their identities and any recognizable details of their lives. And are the narratives I use in my research by our time together around a tape recorder, pen, and notebook. Of these 12 women, all have been married except one, four have been divorced, and six live in polygamous unions. Although I do not know if the incidence of divorce and polygamy in this group is representative of the experiences of all Sunni women, I am struck by the high degree of marital dissatisfaction that they relate, given the strong emphasis Sunni culture places on obedient and docile wives and the movement's defense of men's rights to polygamy in Senegal. Also surprising is the contrast between my respondents' narratives today and their highly idealistic narratives of marriage in the early years of my research with them. Certainly many Sunni women are happily married and many who are in polygamous unions carve out intimate emotional spaces that they share with their husbands and children while maintaining friendly relations with their co-wives. 
It is not out of prurient interest or a desire to criticize Islam that I explore other Sunni women's unhappiness or resistance when it occurs in their marriages. I am interested in their feelings from the standpoint that their sentiments and reactions comprise a fourth space of feminine agency that has yet been neglected by current trends in the scholarly literature on Islam. In this paper, I hypothesize that the source of my respondents' disappointments is the contradiction of their hopes for romantic love and their sense of autonomy spurred by education and career successes versus upper middle class Sunni men's choices to take second wives earlier in, in their marriages to their first wives, along with the premium Sunni culture places on female docility. It is the psychic space of disappointment and anger that I call emotional transgression which may represent a fourth form of agency in Sunni women's lives in addition to their spiritual, political, and social self-determination. Agency is commonly understood in the social sciences to be the ability to realize one's goals against the constraints of a hegemonic power. In the late 1990s, a spate of research on conservative Muslim women emerged detailing their successes in employing Islam to win influence over men, assert themselves in the workplace, and promote political parties that furthered their economic interests. These analyses mostly ignored the question of spiritual sentiment, relegating religion to mere decoration for what were seen as women's liberatory and rationalist endeavors. In 2001, Saba Mahmoud, the author of uh, The Politics of Piety, reversed the terms of this debate uh, when in her study of Cairo's Muslim revivalist women, she challenged scholars' assumptions that agency required defiance of norms, charging that this represented a secular liberal bias often blindly applied by Western scholars. For Mahmoud, all forms of desire, including the desire for individual liberation, are contextually based social constructs. Like Foucault and the feminist theorist Judith Butler, she argues that the subject does not precede social norms. The very processes which establish a subject's subordination are the means by which he or she becomes a self-conscious identity and agent. But, unlike Butler, Mahmoud does not find the subject's agency in the performative errors and reappropriations that actually challenge hegemony. For Mahmoud, inhabiting, performing, and experiencing norms as they are opposed from above can be agency. It is the Kyren women's consistent and conscious efforts to train their impulses and sentiments to an Islamic ethics of docility that represents their agency, not an intentionally political act. The political aspects of their religious activism, such as destabilizing gender hierarchies in the home or disconcerting the secular state, are unintended effects of their endeavors to become more pious in Mahmoud's perspective. In contrast to the Kairen women in Mahmoud's study, Senegal's Sunni women exercise overt political agency, defying Sufi influences and vocally challenging the state's secular policies on the family. They also devise spiritual agency, finding closeness to God and personal solace through rituals such as prayer, Quranic study, and veiling. Third, Sunni women reap a number of social benefits from their status as veiled and pious women, pious Muslims, such as creating friendship and employment networks in addition to new opportunities to marry. Young, single Sunnis of both genders enact clearly defined scripts of Islamic gender relations, looking down when addressing one another, lowering their voices, and smiling shyly at the ground, calling each other frere or brother, or sir, or sister. In one of the Sunni student associations at the University of Dakar, I have frequently observed young women enacting obedience to their male counterparts, shushing themselves and apologizing after the stern face of a 20-year-old frere appears at the curtain of the women's room of the mosque to chastise them for their raucous laughter and conversation. For their parts, young Sunni men engage in brief but very serious courtships of a female adherent typically in, pu in public or accompanied by a chaperone, usually another frere or sir, and then request her hand in marriage. Because many young Sunnites advocate against the bride price and they oppose expensive weddings as sacrilegious, early marriage has been frequent among them. 
In this system, Sunni women avoid the treachery of, predatory of the predatory dating scene in Dakar, characterized by young men who pressure young women for sex, and by young women who relinquish their virginity in search of material support, sometimes from multiple boyfriends. Young female Sunnites often blend the possibility of rapid and early marriages with feelings of deep romantic love for Sunni men. As James Jasper points out, notions of self, love, and relationships are often key aspects of contemporary social movement participation. As the duties of a pious and obedient wife are one of the most popular topics in sermons and radio shows by Sunni leaders, young female adherents frequently engage in conversations with one another, discussing the religious legality of polygamy and the spiritual beliefs of accepting it, the spiritual benefits of accepting it. In their efforts to prepare themselves psychologically for the addition of a second wife, they also articulate their hopes that their co-wives will be Sunni as well, since Sunni women are seen to respect polygamy and would therefore not cause disharmony in the family unit. My long-term respondents' idealization of marriage has not changed since their younger days, and they still claim that they do not oppose polygamy in principle. Yet what is striking in the stories of their married lives is the consistency with which they articulate conflicted, hurt, and angry feelings about polygamy. They do not seem to achieve the same sense of resolution as Mahmoud's Egyptian respondents who retrain their frustrated sentiments about their husbands back towards docility. I will now present to you three of my respondents' narratives which reveal their feelings of in ongoing internal conflict. In January 2010, when I asked Aida, a seamstress educated in the Franco-Arab system who makes a good living sewing intricately embroidered veils and shadors, how she felt about the possibility of polygamy in her marriage, she replied, nobody likes it, but what can we do? It's the way things are here. The Quran says polygamy is not an obligation for men, but the young men here make it an obligation. Her tone was insistent as she spoke, and by her words, make it an obligation, she implied that the young men in her midst did not become polygamous out of religious sentiment, but out of